From Two Keto LLC, it's the Obesity Code Podcast with Dr. Jason Fung and Megan Ramos. Each week, we bring you lessons and stories from the Intensive Dietary Management Program in Toronto, Canada. I'm Carl Franklin. And on today's show, we're talking about the experience of 97% of all dieters known as the dietary yo yo. The Obesity Code Podcast is brought to you by 2Keto LLC, who strives to support the low-carb community with podcasts and other publications. And you can support our mission by making a monthly pledge, no matter how small, at patreon.2keto.com. Today's show centers around IDM patient Melissa Bishop, who spent most of her life bouncing up and down on the strings of various diets. My journey with dieting is heartbreaking to myself because I tried absolutely everything. Um, uh, Metafast, Nutrisystem, Weight Watchers multiple times, calorie counting, and I would always lose the weight. And then I would always gain the weight back. I have a feeling nearly everyone has experienced the yo-yo at some point. I know I have. The conventional wisdom is that most people who diet regain the weight. Here's Dr. Fung. So whether you do a ketogenic diet, a paleo diet, a calorie-controlled diet, low-fat diet, really whatever sort of diet you want to do, it generally does pretty well for about six months. The problem is that the weight starts creeping back up. And a lot of people assume that this is because people stop following the diet. But if you talk to enough dieters, you'll realize that this is not really the case. Most people continue to follow the diet. It's just that it seems to stop working. And this is one of the reasons that people say that all diets don't work and this is just meant to be and this kind of thing. Now, just to drive the point home, Dr. Fung talks about a study where this effect has been documented. If you look at the studies uh, that have been done in the literature, there's several large studies. Uh, one of the biggest one is the Women's Health Initiative, which was almost 50,000 postmenopausal women who are randomized to sort of a low-fat calorie controlled diet. Um, and what they found was that people did pretty well for about a year, six months to a year, and then the weight crept right back up. And by the time they hit six or seven years, despite continuing to follow this calorie-restricted diet, what they found was that the weight was essentially no different than what they had um, started with. So all that weight that they struggled so hard to lose came right back. So like many of us, Melissa experienced this quite a lot. And like most of us, She blamed herself when she failed. When I listened to Dr. Fung explaining the process, I almost started crying because every time I lost the weight and then gained the weight, it made me feel like a complete and total failure. For more on how we blame the obese for their condition, listen to episode two of the Obesity Code podcast. But as Dr. Fung explains, there are real reasons why the weight comes back. And spoiler alert, it's not for a lack of willpower. There's two major issues with standard weight loss techniques. One is that the metabolic rate tends to slow down. There was a study done by a team led by Kevin Hall of the NIH who tested the metabolic behavior of contestants from The Biggest Loser. And that, of course, is Richard Morris, my co-host of the Two Keto Dudes podcast, He's talking about The Biggest Loser, which is a reality TV show in which people competed to lose weight. The team tested 14 contestants before the competition, at the conclusion of the competition, and then six years later they tested them again and found some interesting and troubling things. 
Before the competition, the contestants weighed an average of 149 kilograms, with a BMI of obese class 3. By the end of the competition, they'd managed as a group to get their weight down to an average of 90 kilograms, or just into a BMI between normal and overweight. Great outcome, right? Well, six years later, when the team went back to test them, their body weight had returned to an average of 132 kilograms, and their BMIs were obese class 3 again. And five of the 14 contestants were even within 1% of their starting weight. Now, at first glance, you might think, well, they must have stopped exercising when the competition finished. But the researchers measured their physical activity. Before the competition, they were doing 5.6 calories of exercise for every kilo that they weighed. By the time the competition had finished, they were doing 10.0 calories for every kilo of body weight. And by the six-year follow-up, That had increased to 10.1 calories, but remember, they'd also gained all the weight back, so now they were doing significantly more exercise, and they still put all of that weight back on. Now you might think, oh, well, they must have fallen off their diets, but the researchers also measured where they got their energy from, and that showed at the six-year follow-up, they were still eating a protein-forward balanced diet. So what had really changed is their resting metabolic rate, the amount of energy that they use just being alive. Before the competition, their rate was over 2,600 kilocalories per day. And at the end of the competition, after having lost all of their weight, it had been cut to just under 2,000 kilocalories per day. And what was very troubling was that after the six-year follow-up, it had been further cut by an additional 100 kilocalories per day. They literally had to work out twice as hard and they were still going backwards. Their bodies responded to a restriction in available calories by making cost savings in their metabolic rates, making it increasingly harder to further restrict calories. As you are burning less calories, you aren't feeling so good. So remember that this is the energy that the body uses to generate body heat, for example, keep your liver, your kidneys, your brain, your heart, all in working condition. And if you're burning less calories, you may, for example, feel very cold all the time. And that's one of the, the, the consistent things uh, people notice when they lose weight is that their basal metabolic rate goes down and they feel cold all the time. So a reduction in basal metabolic rate due to calorie restriction is one of the major reasons why people eventually regain the weight. Another reason is hunger. If you look at weight loss and measure either hormones or look at subjective scales of hunger, you'll find that hunger is increased. So you can measure something called ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone. And if you force people to lose weight, 10% of their weight over one year, then what you find is that their uh, ghrelin levels are much higher than they were before they lost the weight. And their satiety hormones, things such as peptide YY and cholecystokinin, they're actually lower than they were. In other words, you're less full. So when you do a scale of how hungry they are, they are more hungry. As Dr. Fung explains, fighting your hormones is most often a losing battle. It's not that these people are have less willpower than they did before, but they are actually physically, hormonally more hungry. And it's very, very hard to ignore hunger because it's one of your most basic survival instincts. And the problem is that you can ignore it for a certain amount of time, but can you do it day in, day out, year after year after year after year? And it's just very, very difficult to do. I can remember very specific times of eating my Weight Watchers lunch. I'm a compulsive person. So I was weighing everything and measuring everything and tracking everything. And I ate my lunch of my deli flat with my two ounces of turkey breast and my laughing cow cheese and was starving afterwards and said to my husband, I am so hungry. I feel like I could chew my arm off. 
And that's how I lived my life. If I could fight that off all day, then I could potentially be successful. Now I'm remembering that the longer I went, the hungrier I got. So it was like the lower my weight got, the hungrier I got. So what's the psychological effect of yo-yo dieting? Well, it's a learned helplessness. We start to equate losing weight with suffering. Therefore, when we discover something that works, like a ketogenic and fasting regimen, we assume we'll have the same old issues we've been having all these years. I was never satisfied. Um, eating lost all joy. I wasn't eating things that were delicious. I was eating things that were on my diet. Um, and everything that was delicious was kind of off limits for me. Dr. Fung tells us why not only does this yo-yo dieting inhibit us physically, but also mentally. One of the things that we have to really guard against is this sort of learned helplessness that uh, people who are trying to lose weight get. Because they've tried so many diets and because so many of these diets have failed again and again, they sort of learn that there's nothing they can do. And I think that this is because most diets focus on only half of the piece of the puzzle. That is, they focus on the foods that you should or should not be eating, but really pay no attention to the sort of when. That is, should you eat once a day, twice a day, three times a day, six times a day, ten times a day, or zero times a day. It turns out that when you eat is just as, if not more important, than what you eat. Eating all of your daily calories in one smaller window every day gives your body more time to lower insulin, and that is the key to undoing insulin resistance. If you have insulin resistance, your body responds by making more insulin. That higher level of insulin over time uh, produces this obesity. So it's really important to Jason and Megan that their patients don't give up hope. They aren't helpless. It will get better. But they've just been focusing on the wrong things. What to eat and not when. So now we know the science behind why most people who diet using calorie restriction, exercise, and or low-fat foods tend to regain the weight. Number one, their metabolic rate goes down meaning calories expended drops. And your metabolic rate can only drop so much for so long before the weight comes back with a vengeance. And number two, hunger hormones increase, pretty much demanding that you either eat or you will die. Those two signals are very powerful and are completely the opposite of what most people think of as the reason why we're all failing at dieting. Willpower. Okay, so there's this idea that fat people have no willpower. I was actually just reading a email today from a physicist who said, you look around and you see these fat people in restaurants and they're eating enormous amounts of food. That's award-winning science and health journalist Gary Taubes. Therefore, the assumption is that eating enormous amounts of food makes them fat to begin with. And the reason they eat enormous amounts of food is because they have no willpower. It's, again, a wonderful idea, but it assumes that somehow they are behaviorally, morally, ethically different than you and I. And there's, again, precious little evidence to support that. The reality is the world is full of uh, obese individuals who not only have extraordinary willpower and are extraordinarily successful at other things they do in their life, um, but also eat relatively little food. In fact, you can find populations around the globe that suffer from what's called the dual burden of obesity and malnutrition. And these are exceedingly poor populations where the children are not getting enough food to, to prosper, to thrive, and yet the uh, older population has high levels of obesity, and particularly the women, who often tend to be the hardest working members of these populations. So this is, again, a hangover from the 19, early 20th century and the most simplistic thinking on obesity, where you think, well, uh, 
We have this idea of the laws of thermodynamics that if somebody gets fatter, they have to take in more energy than they expend, and then we uh, use that to assume that they get fatter because they take in more energy than they expend, and then we look around and we see obese people, and they're eating a lot, and they're not running marathons. So therefore, overeating, Gluttony is a cause, and sedentary behavior, or the biblical term sloth, is a cause. And I think it's almost incomprehensibly naively simplistic, but nonetheless, this is still how much of the research community, much of the public health community, and the dietitians and the nutritionists, invariably the thin ones, think about why the fat ones got that way. It was really devastating for me, which sounds a little ridiculous, but I've said to um, a lot of people in my life, like food really brings me a lot of joy. And I, and I get it now that, I'm a, that I feel that I am, quote, allowed now to eat food that's delicious and satisfying. It should be joyful. You should eat things that are delicious and satisfying. But I was never able to do that. And the last time I lost the weight, I was eating 1200 calories a day. I was using my fitness pal and I was exercising about two hours a day. Okay. So is it necessary to restrict calories to lose weight? That's always the question. If you want to get thinner, you got to eat less or exercise more. You have to change the balance of calories you're taking in and taking out. And this is sort of the the bedrock belief in all of obesity research. When you read obesity research papers, they talk about obesity as an energy balance disorder. I mean, I know researchers who have endowed chairs in energy balance research because the idea is, you know, people get fat because they take in too many calories and they expend too less. And the point I've been making in others for the past decade now is that this is almost an incomprehensibly naive statement. It's like saying that somebody got rich because they took in more money than they spent. I mean, imagine uh, you, I'm giving, instead of giving a lecture on obesity, I'm giving a lecture on, on, on wealth or socioeconomic disparities. And somebody in the audience says to me, hey, you know, why is Bill Gates so rich? And I say, because he took in more money than he expended. I will be laughed out of the auditorium. But if you ask me why, I don't know, why Oprah is often so heavy, she goes up and down, but why does Oprah struggle with her weight? And I say because she takes in more calories than she expends. That's a completely acceptable answer. And in fact, to say anything else is almost considered um, naive. The last time Melissa successfully lost weight before discovering keto and fasting, was in 2012. I lost about 52 pounds and uh, struggled to keep it off and then started a new job where I couldn't exercise two hours a day. And my hours were a little crazy. It was a little stressful. And slowly the weight just creeped back up. I asked Melissa what she was eating when she was at her lowest weight. Oh, I was eating egg whites. And I was eating low-fat cheese, and I was eating vegetables and fat-free dressing, basically dieting frankenfood. It was all weird manufactured stuff because on certain diet plans, you know, there's a, you can kind of game it with things that have more fiber. You know, I was playing a game. Oh, I can so relate. I'd think, well, my body just naturally wants to be heavy, so I have to outthink it with all these clever foods and supplements designed by smart lab coat types. Yeah, that's just how it goes. I wasn't sleeping well at all, and I have, it's been my, I feel like my claim to fame (laughs) is that I've always been a really good sleeper, and I stopped sleeping. I wasn't sleeping through the night. Uh, I would wake up and I couldn't fall back asleep. I've already gone through menopause, so they weren't menopausal issues. Um, I had no energy. I used to take a nap every day. I could not stay awake until, like, until it was time to go to bed. You know, my energy was terrible. 
I would power through to get my exercise done because that was one of the only ways that I thought that I was keeping the weight off. I couldn't get anything done. I would make dinner and basically sit until it was bedtime. Like many of the other IDM patients you've heard from in past episodes, Melissa's metabolic issues started when she was very young. My metabolic issues started, I think, probably in high school. I was never morbidly obese, but I struggled with my weight my entire life. My mom and my sister are very thin naturally and kind of ate whatever they wanted. And my father um, was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes um, when I was in high school. Um, But interestingly, his doctor apparently told him he was diabetic, but he wasn't really. But his doctor at the time knew that it would change the way he was eating. And then he lost weight. He became not diabetic. Well, you know, family lore is that he was never really diabetic. But then he let it slip and gained the weight back and then got uh, gained a lot of weight and then was diagnosed, and then started giving himself insulin. To be clear, her father was diagnosed as a type 2 diabetic and was prescribed insulin, which he gave himself. It was awful watching him get more sick and more fat. And I remember one Christmas in particular, Thanksgiving, where I had made apple pies, and he insisted on taking one whole pie and what was left over of a second pie. And I said, you're diabetic. You shouldn't be doing that. And he said, I'll just give myself more insulin. So it was a horrible thing to watch. And I knew that um, that was definitely, you know, a possibility for me. I never let my weight get that bad. But when I would do blood work, you know, I feel like I was always kind of on that edge. In uncontrolled diabetes, whether or not it's type 1 or type 2, you are going to end up with complications. But they're completely avoidable by running low carb. And that's Gary Fetke, Australian orthopedic surgeon and low carb advocate, who also ends up dealing with the amputations that happen at the final stages of diabetes. Diabetes is an inability to manage the carbohydrate and specifically the glucose load that your body's presented with. And most times that comes with what you eat sometimes with a bit of stress and exercise, but effectively diabetes is that inability to control what, you, what you're presented with. So you've got two options. One is you can eat what you want and then just take medication and do that on an increasing aspect for the rest of life and get poor control. Or the other option is you can actually reduce the amount you eat, which is to run low carb. And if you do that, you're going to end up requiring less medication. You're going to have less complications and you're going to have less highs and less lows. It's as simple as that. And did Melissa's dad make her recovery from diabetes? No, it got him. It absolutely got him. And uh, it was, it, again, it was just heartbreaking to watch um, because he would just give himself more insulin. He'd sit at the table and eat and just shoot it right through his shirt. Really, he died of congestive heart failure. I think his body just uh, couldn't take the stress of what he was doing to it. Um, he just kept getting, yeah, it was awful. And then that all that diabetic, that weird diabetic stuff with your feet and neuropathy and um, and just all of that. And they used to travel a lot. And, you know, it was always a big issue. To That was before insulin was as easily transportable as it is now. And yeah, he'd need a refrigerator in his room and he did not change how he was eating. And I wish that I had known then what I know now. I could have at least educated him. So let's recap. Melissa clearly has a family history of type 2 diabetes. She tried in vain for years to keep her weight in check by restricting calories. Every single time she lost weight this way, her metabolic rate would go down and her hunger hormones would go up. And as a result, the weight would come back on. I just felt like I failed. And I am married to someone who's very thin, naturally, who doesn't really like to eat. This is my 
It's a horrible thing for me. <laughs> My cross to bear. And uh, he just didn't understand it. He would say, I don't understand. Just don't put the food in your mouth. And I would have a hard time stopping when I started, which now I understand the foods that I was eating were physically making it harder to stop eating. But I didn't know that at the time. The problem with insulin resistance is that your body compensates by producing more insulin. So if you were to measure insulin levels in the morning when they should be low, somebody with insulin resistance is going to have very high levels. And of course, if you have very high levels of insulin, you're going to want to gain weight. Similarly, if you simply reduce your calories, but don't adjust this sort of insulin resistance thermostat, then eventually the insulin resistance keeps insulin levels high, which is independent of the diet. And so even as you're forcing your weight down, the thermostat is trying to pull yourself back up. And this is the key. So what we have to understand is how to lower insulin resistance, and it depends on two key factors, the sort of what to eat, but also the when to eat. Because resistance as a general biological phenomenon depends upon not just the levels, but also persistence of those high levels. That is, high levels of insulin by itself will not cause insulin resistance. But high levels of insulin, persistent over time, and this can be decades, may cause insulin resistance. And as you get the insulin resistance, it causes more insulin to be produced, which makes this cycle go round and round and round. So just when Melissa had hit rock bottom, she had a little bit of good luck. Um, actually got a free download of an Audible book. And I don't even know how it happened, but it said something books you might be interested in. And it was Dr. Fung's Fasting, The Complete Guide to Fasting. So I started listening during work, during my lunch. I would walk and listen um, to a chapter a day. And all of a sudden, I felt like everything kind of fell into place. I was crazed. I it was like all of a sudden someone had given me the secret to something I had been struggling to figure out for my whole life. And I started fasting right away, even though I wasn't really keto at that point. I tried to stop eating processed foods. I was really trying to clean up my diet and be more um, conscious of what I was eating. For my whole life, I believed the you can't miss a meal or your metabolism will slow down. Here's Dr. Fung on why your metabolism does not slow down when you miss a meal. Uh, as we talked about before, there's two really important parts uh, that cause the weight plateau and the weight regain. One is slowing metabolism and two is hunger signaling. So the question is, what can you do about it? One of the things that we have to do for the body metabolism is to keep it high. That's one of the reasons why people always say you should never skip a meal. Because they say you're going to go into starvation mode and your metabolism is going to slow and then that will make things worse. And it sounds pretty reasonable, but it's completely untrue. So you have to understand a little bit about what causes um, the metabolism to slow. And really, the key player here is, no surprise, insulin. Insulin is a key signal when you switch between a fed state and a fasted state. Insulin goes up when you eat, and it goes down when you fast. At the same time, insulin is a fat storage hormone. When it's high, food energy gets stored as fat. And when it's low, energy is extracted from body fat. As you become more and more obese, you develop more and more of this insulin resistance, then insulin levels stay high even when you don't eat. Because you have this resistance, your insulin levels are elevated, and your body, because it doesn't drop, your body doesn't get that signal to pull this energy back out. 
to burn it, it's still saying, hey, store food energy even as no food is coming in. So you don't have access to your stores of body fat. So technically what we say is insulin inhibits lipolysis. So insulin blocks fat burning. Therefore, if you've shut off all your fat stores, then the only energy you can burn is the fuel that's coming in through your food. So the takeaway is lower insulin is necessary for you to access body fat for fuel and therefore lose weight. And the easiest and fastest way to drop your insulin level is by fasting. When your insulin is low, your body can burn that body fat. And guess what? It has all the energy it needs. It does not need to dial back your metabolic rate. I believed the you can't miss a meal or your metabolism will slow down, which now I find absolutely hysterical, ridiculous, and it makes me angry. Uh, Because I can remember being in the car with my husband and saying, I'm hungry, and if I don't eat, (laughs) something really bad's going to happen to me. And so I started fasting. I did three days, and the next week I did seven days. Not eating for seven days seems crazy, doesn't it? How did she feel? And I was like euphoric. I can remember walking with my husband and just, it was day seven and I was just shocked. I cannot believe that I have not eaten for seven days and I have this much energy and I feel this great and this is amazing. And then I thought, you know, I probably should get some help. So Melissa reached out to IDM for help and spoke with Megan, of course, right before she was about to go on a European vacation. When I had my first interview with Megan, I said, she asked me, why do you want to do this? And I said, because I feel like I am the kind of person that could very easily slip into disordered eating. And I want to make sure that it doesn't happen. I also really like to have the right answer for things. And the internet's great and that you can get a lot of information, but sometimes the information that you get might not be 100% correct. Along the way, um, Megan has been incredibly supportive, given me great information, uh, always there when I need her or gets me prepared for something else. You know, I was really nervous about my vacation. And she said, go and enjoy it. Try not to snack. You'll be fine. Melissa had been part of the IDEA program for about six months prior to her European cruise. And that's Megan Ramos, director of the Intensive Dietary Management Program. There are a few key things that Melissa realized were very important for her success. The first thing was having a predictable routine, knowing which days of the week she would fast, knowing which days of the week she would feast, and knowing what she would feast on. On fasting days, the preparation came in um, ways of her making sure that she was getting adequate electrolytes. So Melissa learned the importance of making sure that she had salt with her everywhere that she went that she would stay properly hydrated and would always have her water bottle with her and that she would have adequate bone broth. She would carry tea bags with her and make sure that she had her coffee with her good fat in it when she needed it to help get her through her fasting days. For her feasting days, she learned the importance of preparing certain foods, having vegetables prepared, having a meal plan in place so she would know what she was going to be eating on those eating days and in those eating windows. One of the biggest ways that people struggle on their eating days is that they're not eating adequate food. They end up rushing and life is hectic and they just sort of eat whatever is available. So Melissa became one heck of a meal planner. So she would always make sure that she had good quality, full meals at each meal that would leave her feeling satisfied till the next time she wanted to eat. Melissa also has children and a husband who don't eat ketogenic like her. 
So she has that added challenge of having carbohydrates around the house. So Melissa realized the importance of having certain safety foods, mostly charcuterie items like salami and prosciutto, having some cooked bacon on hand, having some hard-boiled eggs and some olives ready in her refrigerator for her consumption, having some dill pickles. She learned the importance that having these foods would prevent her when the cravings became too strong for the carbohydrates her family might have lying around. Melissa also had to figure out how to give up snacking outside of her time window and to eat more within that time window, which takes some getting used to. So one of the biggest vices that the majority of my clients struggle with is nuts. Very few people eat nuts sensibly. For us, we're very busy, we're always on the go. We do not spend adequate time preparing for proper meals. So we're always eating half meals and we end up substituting for nutrients by snacking on nuts. In the IDM program, we're not afraid of nuts. Great nuts like macadamia nuts and walnuts, almonds and pecans, pine nuts. There's so many great nuts out there. But nuts need to be part of your meal. You need to be eating full meals, not just partial meals. And the nuts that you do have need to be part of these meals. If you've had lunch, and a couple of hours later, you feel like having a handful of almonds, you did not eat enough at lunch. Before her European cruise, Melissa went on a weekend getaway with a few of her girlfriends. She brought along all her great keto safety foods. And she found that even though she spent four days eating, she didn't gain any weight. This experience gave her the confidence she needed for her trip. I was actually on vacation. We were in Europe for 10 days. And I had made a decision that I'm going to try and be keto, but I'm also not going to turn down something that's delicious that I might not ever find again. Or that, you know, like Prague is known for its Pilsner beer. I don't really drink beer anymore, but I wanted to have some beer. The entire time she was very careful because she was frankly afraid that if she cheated too much, she might never get back on it. And I have failed before on diets where I look back and think, I don't know what happened. How did I gain all this weight? <laughs> like, I, because you let things creep in and you kind of let your guard down. So I ate a lot. I ate, um, my breakfast was generally very ketogenic. It was bacon and, sl- and smoked salmon and some meats and cheeses and eggs Lunch was a little hard. And then we were places where I wanted to try the food. Like we were in Vienna and they're known for Wiener schnitzel, which is breaded chicken. And so I had it. I tr- It was interesting. I tried to fast on the plane ride home and I made it uh, probably about 18 hours. And then I just wasn't feeling well. And I thought, you know what? It's probably because I had all these carbs So I asked Melissa, what was the damage from the holiday? First of all, I did gain weight when I was gone, which was sobering. Um, I gained 10 pounds. I'm down three already. Uh, And I would like to get probably to lose like another 15 pounds. I would be super happy at that weight. But I feel like the weight that I'm at right now, I could live at this weight for the rest of my life and be happy and be comfortable in my clothing and feel normal. And what about the specter of diabetes? How's your blood sugar? My blood sugar is great. I got a ketone meter so I can test my ketones. I wasn't testing my blood sugar uh, originally, but then I kind of wanted to fool around with it and to see how certain foods that I eat do affect me. So then I got that and my blood sugars are fabulous. So let's go through Melissa's transformation. She started eating low carb in March of 2017. And then I read the fasting book. And then right after that, read the obesity code and then transitioned to ketogenic and to fasting. And in April, she started paying more attention to hidden sugars and carbohydrates that were in foods that she thought might have been healthy and okay. 
And, you know, this is what a lot of people say. They start low carb and then, oh, you mean fruit has sugar? You know, in Weight Watchers, fruit is free, which means you can eat as much fruit as you want. But I, you know, I had no idea that fruit had so much sugar in it. So Melissa continued fasting and ketogenic eating all the way up until the cruise, which she had just returned from before we spoke. I started eating keto. We got back on Wednesday. So actually, I started eating keto on Thursday and today's Saturday. So this is my third day. And I'm so happy to be back. Oftentimes, when you leave a diet and then you have to go back, I think that's where people fail because going back is so miserable. You've been eating all this delicious food and you don't want to go back. But I feel like eating a ketogenic diet, I'm happy to go back. One thing that happens to people who discover the health benefits of a low-carb, high-fat way of life is that after a while, we get mad. We wonder why our doctors don't know about it. And we blame ourselves for not being able to follow their advice. I asked Melissa, who really deserves the blame? Oh my gosh, I am really angry. Okay, the first person I'm angry at is Ansel Keys. He did all of us an incredible disservice by the whole seven countries that really wasn't seven countries. It was more like 21 countries, but he chose to only use seven of those countries to make the point that he wanted to. So I'm very mad at him. I'm mad at our government for subsidizing all of those crops that we're paying for. And then we're also paying for the health care for the people that are sick from those crops, from all that high fructose corn syrup and those things that are put into the food that make it harder for us to stop eating and make us sick. George McGovern, you know, the whole grain subsidy thing. I'm mad at him. So really the story goes back to the 1950s when the nation was in a panic over the rising tide of heart disease that had come from pretty much out of nowhere in the early 1900s. It was very rare to become becoming the nation's leading number one killer. And that's Nina Teicholz, author of The Big Fat Surprise, which was named a 2014 best book by The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Mother Jones and Library Journal. I mean, all of a sudden, men whose fathers had lived to old age, they were having heart attacks and dying in the midst of their youth. And this was terrifying to people, including the fact that President Eisenhower himself had a heart attack in 1955, was out of the Oval Office for 10 days. Imagine that. Your president is out of the Oval Office for 10 whole days. So the whole nation was just absolutely fixated on this question, what causes heart disease? And people really didn't know. There was a number of competing explanations. Some people thought it was due to vitamin deficiencies, which is actually a pretty good, pretty good idea. Uh, some people thought it was due to uh, the rising uh, auto exhaust fumes. Um, other people thought it was personality type A stress. And in that vacuum stepped Ansel Keys. He was a physiologist at the University of Minnesota, a kind of very charismatic man. He was um, called arrogant even by his friends. He had an unshakable faith in his own beliefs, and he could argue anyone to the death, is how one person put it to me. His idea was that it was saturated fats and cholesterol, dietary cholesterol that caused heart disease. Saturated fats and cholesterol would clog your arteries like hot grease down a cold stovepipe, and that would give you a heart attack. And he was able to get his idea implanted into the American Heart Association such that in 1961, the American Heart Association, which was then really the only group giving any kind of dietary advice for heart disease, they issued the world's very first recommendation to avoid saturated fat and cholesterol in order to avoid a heart attack. That was the tiny acorn that grew into the giant oak tree of advice that we have today. In place of saturated fats, the American Heart Association said to eat unsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats. What was that? That meant instead of butter, you eat margarine. Instead of uh, meat, 
you have, um, I don't know, I never quite figured it out, like have uh, vegetable oils for dinner, but you, <laughs> you have chicken fried in, in canola oil or something. I'm mad at the American Heart Association that they're taking money and they're, they're telling us things that aren't true and people believe it. And physicians who, physicians in positions of power are still like towing that cholesterol line and the saturated fat line, even though there's so much information out there that is, that shows it's not true. And I work for physicians and I've really only had one of them who's willing to even listen. It makes me angry that there's all these people out there that are fat and feel awful about themselves and think that they're doing something wrong when in addition, we're being told to do the wrong thing. And if you look at the, the graphs of obesity and the low fat diet, like it, they track identical to each other. So from the minute it was the low fat diet, I remember snack wells coming out and people saying, well, you know, that fat is more fattening. And that's why I think about sitting at the beach and eating Twizzlers and thinking I was doing a good thing for myself. <laughs> and, and it makes me angry that all the, I hate to use the word fake news, but it's fake news when they talk about saturated fat makes you sick and that a low fat diet is still the healthiest way to eat. We're not being given the right information. Dietary guidelines currently suggest capping your saturated fat content as a percent of calories at 10%. In 2015, they actually were not going to review any of, you know, there's been this upsurge of interest in saturated fats, um, and there's been a, teams of internationals, of scientists all over the world who've reviewed the data on saturated fats. And because there's been a lot of, um, you know, the book, Gary Taubes' book, my book, we've sort of raised this issue that there are all these clinical trials that have been ignored on saturated fats. And so many scientists around the world have gone back and dug up these trials to see what did they really say. And that's why we've had like more than a dozen systematic reviews of that data to say, actually, saturated fats are not the demon that we thought they were. They do not cause heart disease, right? The Dietary Guideline Committee in 2015 was going to ignore all of that research even though it is their specific job to go over the last five years of research to see if anything new has come up, they were going to ignore it all. I happen to do a bunch of Freedom of Information Act requests, and um, I've read the Dietary Guideline Committee emails to each other. And actually, there was one systematic review by a guy named, uh, led by a team from Harvard and Cambridge. Um, the lead name on that is Chowdhury. But it, that review came out in March. My book came out in May. And the Dietary Guideline Committee freaked out. And like mid-May, they're like, we have to do a review on saturated fats because those rumors are popping up again about how saturated fats, you know, it's just like we have to tamp down the, the truth that's bubbling up. So they did a review of saturated fats, but they did it in this very, um, they didn't review the evidence comprehensively. They misinterpreted the, the reviews that they looked at. Um, and there's, there's a couple of emails where um, one of the Dietary Guideline Committee members is, says, well, you know, that number, 7% cap limit on saturated fats or 10% limit on saturated fats, there's really no data for it. We just picked that number out of thin air. And now... In the largest ever epidemiological study, even with the, the, all the caveats that we have to recognize about epidemiology, that shows that if you cap your saturated fat to 10%, which is what our government currently tells us to do, that the risk of stroke goes up dramatically if you're eating less than 10% of your calories of saturated fats, which is to say our dietary guidelines may be, are almost very likely increasing the risk of stroke. And certainly there's Nobody with eating fewer than 10% of your calories as saturated fats who had any better cardiovascular outcome. So there, there is just no data anymore to support that kind of cap on saturated fats. 
There's almost nothing in the dietary guidelines that is based on rigorous clinical trial evidence. Of the many ways that dietary guidelines is, are not evidence-based is, is on whole grains, on grains at all. There's no evidence to show that we need grains to survive. It's actually six to 11 servings of grains per day that the dietary guidelines recommends. And in the language of the guidelines, the top line language, they say, we recommend whole grains. One of the most respected organizations in the world called the Cochrane Group, which does nothing but do systematic reviews of scientific literature, they looked at whole grains and concluded that there was zero clinical trial evidence. That is to say, there's zero rigorous evidence to support the idea that whole grains can combat heart disease. That was originally why we were sold them, right? That eat whole grains because those are better for, for fighting heart disease. But the Cochrane Review could not find any evidence for that. Our dietary guidelines recommend the same amount of refined grains as whole grains. So in those 6 to 11 servings of grains every day, half of them, are, it is required and recommended, and in your school lunches and in your you know feeding programs for the elderly, that those be refined. Do you know why? Because only refined grains are enriched and fortified. And without those nutrients, which include iron and folate and some of the B vitamins, which Americans are deficient in, we would be even more deficient in them. Where are those vitamins normally in minerals? They're in meat. Meat, eggs, dairy, you know, mainly meat, mainly liver, right? But we're not allowed to eat those foods because of the limits on saturated fats. They artificially fortify and enrich refined grains, and then they require that we eat them. They actually did a little experiment. I, this is part of the emails that I got from my Freedom of Information Act request. They tried to see if they could get rid of refined grains, knowing that they probably should not be still recommending them. And they discovered that the guidelines would um, even be more nutritionally insufficient than they already were. So they couldn't do that. So they continue to recommend equal amounts of refined grains as whole grains. And that is outrageous. That's why kids are getting like, you know, white flour Danish with sugar in them for breakfast at schools. And we think we're helping our children by feeding them healthy breakfasts. I think in like the next 15 years that eating a ketogenic or a low carb diet is going to be what's recommended. Because I think there's going to come a point where you can't dispute or refute all of the evidence. And I watch people. I watch it happening to people that I know. People who are on Weight Watchers who now the weight is creeping back. And it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to watch. Well, I work in a doctor's office. And so I interact with patients all day and staff all day and I see that the food we eat is making us all very sick. I see patients come in who are having multiple issues. I work for a GI office and the food they're eating is giving them reflux. The food that they're eating is making them sick. It, they're diabetic, which we know how many things, you know, once you hit that diabetic button, everything else just starts falling apart. And we have pharmaceutical people who come in who want us to, you know, they talk about their medicines. They bring us a lunch which is a very unhealthy lunch. Um, and I've learned to walk away. I go to the gym during lunch when we have those lunches because I don't want to eat that food. I know it's not good for me. I feel now like I'm just getting better. Like I'm getting stronger. My body's in better shape. Everything is better. My hair is better. My, my teeth are better. Like it's, it really is like I, the fountain of youth or like a magic bullet. 
I asked Melissa if she's talked to the doctors and the nurses about low carb, and did she get anywhere? I've tried. I have one doctor who's actually eating a low carb diet now. Um, and then the other ones just ask for the studies, but they're not really interested in the studies. It's an odd it's an odd thing because again, I've been reading a lot and listening a lot. And they say that physicians get about three hours of nutritional training in medical school. And it's doctors just want to write prescriptions. And I have friends that are doctors and I work for great doctors, but they really just want to write the prescription. The problem with most doctors now is they're just really not up to date. We've been talking about total cholesterol, LDL, HDL cholesterol, but it's just like lipid markers have, and our understanding of them have moved, have, our understanding has just vastly grown in the last 10, 20 years. It's just, it's just hyper linked forward. As we now understand the most meaningful risk factors for heart disease, the low carb diet really improves all of those. LDL cholesterol, that's the kind of the sticking point one. Low carb diets tend to raise people's LDL cholesterol, the bad, the so-called bad cholesterol. Well, here's something most people don't understand. LDL cholesterol does not track well with uh, your your cardiovascular risk. In the studies where they actually look at to see who dies, it's never related to their LDL cholesterol level. So LDL cholesterol turns out to be a super poor predictor of cardiovascular risk. My daughter says I've become like an evangelist. I try to encourage people and I try not to judge and I try and educate. I've started a meetup a ketogenic living meetup and our first meeting is a week from Monday and I bring ketogenic treats into the office so that people can see you can still eat delicious food but you know there's a woman who's a very good friend of mine who said she couldn't give up her Cheerios people don't realize or aren't willing to admit that they're addicted my husband I want him to be healthier. So it's not about his weight because he's underweight. But I see what he eats and I've been trying to change the way he's eating. And I decided when our kids went back to college, let's try this. Because when the when my kids are home and my boys are athletes and they want to eat a lot of food and they want to gain weight and I basically cook for them and then I just kind of eat around them. But for my husband... I said, let's give it a shot. Like you're not, you know, he complains about his, his like b body hurting. He's not sleeping. He could not do it. We started on a Saturday night and by Tuesday he had given up. I guess he doesn't want to own it, which makes me, I don't know, it just makes me sad. And I love eating a ketogenic diet. Like when people say it's too restrictive, I don't understand that. It's delicious. And how much weight has Melissa lost? I've lost 35 pounds. And the best part is it's been pretty painless, which is uh, an amazing gift. I don't think I'm ever going to be fat again. You know, I may gain a little weight, but I'll never be fat again because it was super easy for me to transition back to keto when I got back. The weight's already starting to come off. I'll start fasting next week. And it's just the way I want to live my life. Well done, Melissa. It's another happy ending to another episode of The Obesity Code. And that's our story for this week. You've been listening to The Obesity Code podcast, lessons and stories from the Intensive Dietary Management Program. The Obesity Code podcast is brought to you by 2Keto LLC, who strives to support the low-carb community with podcasts and other publications. And you can support our mission by making a monthly pledge, no matter how small, at patreon.2keto.com. I'm Carl Franklin. We'll see you next time.